So we, today is on the 18th of December 2020. Uh, so what we'll be doing tonight is to prepare ourselves for the Christmas season. Amen. Amen. Then on Sunday we will look at the theme for for the Christmas, uh, which happens to be something like God is with us, Emmanuel. That will be our theme for the Christmas. So tonight is just a preparation. But I can even see that it's quite, uh, uh, tonight has a lot to teach us as well. Amen. Quite a lot. So, uh, we've entitled our sermon this way, that God expects us to replace all idols with his glory. And Christmas can be an idol. And many people argue that Christians are not supposed to celebrate Christmas because that celebration was somehow dedicated to a pagan god. And so a lot of Christians really kick against the celebration. And they make a whole lot of uh, you know, noise about it. But it's very simple if we understand how we can replace every idol with God's glory, then we don't have problem. And in fact, every celebration uh, was meant to be a celebration to the Lord Almighty. But the problem is that uh, you know, somehow the enemy, Satan, has occupied important uh, places in our lives. And so he has uh, special occasions as well. Hallelujah. And so if we, we, we will learn how to replace every idol with God's glory, then Christmas or whatever uh, can also be a great opportunity for us to uh, see the, uh, the blessings of the Lord. And tonight we'll be looking at the life of Gideon, I think we've we'll looked at this some uh, where this year. Gideon, where the angel of the Lord told him to build a proper kind of altar to the Lord. And then that instruction actually meant that uh, Gideon was to replace bar altar and put God's altar at the same spot there. Okay, so, so Gideon did that. And so at that same place where they, they were worshiping idols, the people were now worshiping God there. So it was a way of replacing idol with God's glory. Okay, and so uh, that will be our focus. And once we understand some of these things, it will be very easy for us to turn every celebration to, to, us, to be an opportunity to serve the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. Once we understand, and we have a lot of idols in our lives. I'll be mentioning the seven uh, mountains of life or seven mountains of prophecy. Uh, which some great men have grouped them to to tell us that all these things have also become an idol in our life. They have become idols. And so how do we get rid of them in our life? Seven mountains. So I've got a, a two different uh, versions of, the, of, of that topic. Uh, I've finished reading them. So at the service, if you want to borrow, yes, you can borrow. And if you think you want to keep a copy... Uh, if you want to buy a copy, you get a copy for yourself. So I have two different copies, one by, yeah, I think the same author, but two different uh, approaches to that same theme. They talk about the seven mountain prophecy or the seven mountain mantle. Mantle means that Christians are supposed to occupy those places. So he talks about the Elijah revolution. He mentioned Joseph and stuff and but i see them as seven mountains of life and then he, he mentions them as one education government uh religion family life economics he talks about arts and culture that is celebration he talks about media seven areas that he th they think they have become idols what that means is that he have become anti-god and and those areas control our lives so if you really want to get rid of idols, then we must look, you know, at these uh, areas of life as well. G uh, government, economics, religion, family life, art and culture. Uh, two more, I'll, I'll just be touching on, on those things. Because now we don't see physical idols, hallelujah. We don't see, they are all philosophies and ideologies. But an idol, as we'll be looking at, is simple, anything that, that takes the place of God. Anything anti-God becomes an idol. And idols have influence in our life. In those days, 
an idol, so let's say bar for example, would teach their people how they should live. So an idol occupies a central, you know, uh, position or place in your life. So our educational system, if it is anti-God, that is an idol, and we must engage critical. And Christmas, again, people see Christmas as idol celebration. So as I said, our preparation tonight, uh, our focus tonight is to prepare ourselves to really go through this Christmas period in a way that will bring God's glory upon ourselves, our family, the church, and our nation. Hallelujah. I mean, I mean so our, our, our text is Judges 6, 24 to 26. So let's read our text. Judges, sorry, Judges 6, 24 to 26. So when uh, Gideon had an encounter with the angel of the Lord, this is what happened. Verse 24 says that, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. So where Gideon had an encounter with the angel of the Lord, he built an altar there and called it the Lord. Those days they did not have the church building or the temple. And so people, you know, were really building altars to the Lord. Wherever they would meet God, then that place became a church. And church actually... It's people coming together in the presence of God. And so, and so that's what he did. So he said, to this day, it stands at Ophrah of the Abizarite, 25. That same night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd. The one, seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So the father was in charge of that community, that society, that the idol worship. And everyone would come there to worship that idol. And so the angel of the Lord said, told him in the night that tear that thing down and then cut that pole beside it. 26. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord. Have you seen the expression? Proper. So you can also celebrate proper Christmas. You can celebrate proper Christmas. So we have Christmas, but we can celebrate proper Christmas. The instruction was simple. Tear it down. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord, your God, on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Amen. So the rest of the story tells us that Gideon did that. Of course, the whole township came and wanted to kill him. But God was with uh, Gideon and the whole people now started worshipping God at this place. The same place, the same spot. So our focus is very simple. You can apply this to almost every aspect of life. That we can always offer proper service worships to God. Even though that thing originally was dedicated to the enemy. Because the truth is that the enemy owes nothing. He has hijacked all that belongs to humanity. Hallelujah. So, 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 so from that, we can approach Christmas uh, differently. And we can approach all other aspects of life differently. And I'll start by saying that one of the reasons heaven is great is because God's glory filled the whole place. Heaven, God's glory. When Isaiah saw the heavens, uh, that was his uh, uh, a message, that, that the glory of the Lord and fill the whole place. So if the earth can also be filled with the glory of God, then the earth can become heaven. Hallelujah. And because the book of Hebrews 2.14 says that, and God's glory and his knowledge will fill the whole earth. And how will that be possible? That can be possible if his people will know how to replace every idol with the glory of the Lord. So that place where they were worshiping idols had become a place where the glory of the Lord in our uh, was. But I also want to say that if we don't pay special attention, what happens is that we allow some things to take God's glory from the society, from our lives. And then the result is that Satan takes over to enslave us in sin and its consequences. 
we then lose our place in the universe. So instead of having dominion, we become burdened. Now, if you read the whole chapter, the Midianites were suppressing the Israelites, right? Not the story. The Midianites were very bad people. So they would wait until it was time for, for harvest. And then they would just come and bounce on the people and take all their harvest. Now, when the angel of the Lord said, Gideon, take away that idol. He was saying that you people are going through suffering because of this idol. So take it away. If we really want to have good life. What an idol does, which I will mention at some point, is that it, it attracts misfortunes. And two, idols makes us vulnerable to our enemies. That's why. So the Midianites always had upper hand over the people of Israel because of that idol there. And the angel said, take this one away. And the moment you do that, go and fight the Midianites. And then you have victory. And as you know the story, Gideon fought the Midianites. And they got victory. So if we have idols in our lives, the best thing is to replace them with the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. So this Christmas present us with the great opportunity to bring God's glory to our families, to our church, and to our nation. This is because Christmas can be an idol. Hallelujah. It can either be an idol or it can also draw us closer to God. So how do we celebrate proper Christmas to God? Simple, make the occasion to be about Him. When the occasion is about Christ, you are bringing the glory of God into the occasion. Hallelujah. And it's very simple. So that's why the church, we've themed this Christmas, God is with us. Emmanuel. Of course, other people will focus on all kinds of things, right? Okay, so, so that becomes sort of their idol during this uh, Christmas uh, season. So God is with us. Now, if, if we are lucky, which we must always pray, our state or country will promote righteousness and the glory of God. So the government can say that ah, Christmas Day, everyone go to church. That's if you are lucky. But I don't think we are lucky enough. Amen. If you are lucky, then your state, your country, your community will promote righteousness and the glory of God. Now, if not, then God expects us to replace every idol with his glory, like he told Gideon. Amen. So if the nation does not call for that, God expect you and I to do that, to replace every idol with his glory. So we want leaders who know the truth. Leadership is very important. They know the truth and they have the grace and will not sleep until God's glory comes upon the people. And that was Gideon. So Gideon, you know, did all that and they fought the Midianites. And the whole Israel, they were free to be blessed. And then when we are praying for leadership, these are the kind of people we should pray for. Hallelujah. People, they know the truth, they have received the grace, and they will not sleep until God's glory comes upon the people. Then we will be blessed. Then we are free to prosper. If not, then the media might. They will be attacking us and be robbing us of our divine uh, blessings. So, so these people become defenders of our faith because they have received the divine calling and they have been prepared and they, they have some sort of heavenly mindset. So they think about the things of God and they give the things of God to the people. And so the, the Bible tells us, pray for your leaders. And anytime you are praying for your leaders, you have to mention this hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So for this reason, God sent Jesus Christ to lead us. And that is why if, if the Christmas, if all of us focus on Christ, what that will mean is that then Christ will warm our hearts and direct our thinking and our focus on the Father. And so Christ has become our leader at a great measure. So let's look at the idols 
and the glory of God, then we look at how we can get rid or replace them, especially the seven mountains. Hallelujah. Now, the seven mountains of education, government, economics. How do we engage with them so that they don't become idols, but rather they become truly mountains where God's glory is? And then blessings come. A typical example uh, we have in the Bible was Joseph. When Joseph became the prime minister, you know, he helped the people. So he was in charge of the economy. So the people were well fed. So at that moment, God's glory was there in that sphere. So when we have God's glory in all these spheres of life, we will see that the people will do up. And on the other hand, if we have anti God's you know, influences, then we are in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why I will encourage some of you to get a book. Uh, it's very good. Uh, my only reservation is that it's more like a challenge for Christians to occupy those places, which I don't think that is our calling. Our calling is first to build a kingdom, to win souls. And if God wants to call anyone, then God will call you there. Right? Yeah, so, so that's my only reservation, but... Apart from that, everything in these books are, 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 are quite very, very good, spot on. Hallelujah. So, so anytime you are reading, keep that in mind, that we are called to be different and not to fight for positions of influence in the world. We are called, but if God wants to send you there, he will send you there for a reason, like Joseph. And once you finish that assignment, that's it. Because all those places, the enemy is in charge. So Revelation 18 will tell us to come out of Babylon. So those systems, right? So I'll, I'll keep that. So let's look at idols first. And then we'll see God's glory and how we can replace them. So, so idols are simple. Anything. It can, it can be a God. It can be a belief. It can be a person. It can be an ideology. Or a lifestyle that takes you away from the Almighty God. That's an idol. Anything that takes you away from the Almighty God is an idol. In other words, that thing influences your life. That thing controls you. It's an idol. So it can be a God. In, the, in those days, they have gods. And some people do have gods. So that those small gods are their God. So they pray to God through. So, so the spirit in that God will tell you what to do. And, of course, the Spirit will always lead you away from the Almighty God. So we'll talk about idols, although you may not see physical idols. That's why, when, I mean, when those great men put this, I uh, 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 wrote this book, I really love it. Because they took their time to, to explain to us some of the idols we, we have now contemporarily. So an idol can be a god, it can be uh, an ideology, it can be... Uh, a person, it can be a lifestyle that takes you away from the Almighty God. Idols tend to occupy central position in one's life or the life of the society. So in the days of Gideon, that Baal was the one, that idol was the one dictating things to the people. How they should live, when they should make sacrifices, the type of sacrifices they should make, that was the idol. So that's what idol I, I, I do also do. They take special place in the lives of the people. And so you can have an idol without knowing. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that idol, will, it even can be a person. So idols also enslaves us, invite misfortunes, and make us vulnerable to our enemies. Idols, so that book, uh, uh, Judges 6, the Israelites were oppressed by the Midianites. Who? And they cried to God. They, be they became very vulnerable and weak. And the Midianites were always coming, uh, uh, you, know, you know, for them. And it's very simple. Because that idol you have, you are not supposed to have it. So that idol will favor, I mean, he saw her own people. Hallelujah. So, yeah. So you have brought an idol into your heart, but that idol you know, does not even belong to you. So that idol knows its people. So it makes you vulnerable so that his people can come for you. 
So the Israelites, they had God. And they had gone for Baal. And so the Midianite had upper hand because the Midianite were Baal worshippers anyway. I mean, that it works. So when you keep an idol in your life, that idol makes you vulnerable and exposes you to your real enemies. That's what happens. Uh, and many people do not know. So, at the, so the presence of the bar in the lives of the Israel was a great source of problem uh, to the people. Now, anywhere you see an idol, brothers and sisters, you have constant problems all the time. Anywhere, I mean, now, now you cannot see physical idols. But those days, if you go to any house where there was an idol, every time there's a problem. Every time there's a problem. Every time. Because the idols trap misfortunes. So the kids maybe will, will start crying and crying. You didn't know what's wrong with them. The kids will start having seizures. The kids will start, uh, you know, behaving funny. Or the men, something bad can happen to the men that they cannot hold jobs or they cannot keep families. Or, or the women cannot, uh, you know, marry or something. They, they, there was always something happening. Now if you go to the Votar region, right, in Ghana, if you go, those places where they have idols, I tell you. And even if you have an idol in your house and you move away, Every occasion, they will go and mention your name. So they will pray to the idol. Idol, da 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 da. We pray for John, who is in Kumasi, that you keep him safe. So then that idol, that demon will be followed with you. So when you come to Jesus, then it is Christ who will say, who will now be your savior and be following you. So every... A uh, person who has idol in his or her house, they are always constant. They are problems. Because, you see, the idols must inflict pains on the people and put some fear in the people so that the people will always obey them. Okay, so Israel suffered a lot. And when the angel said, Gideon, go and deliver your people from the Midianite, the next thing he told him was that get rid of that idol bah, from there. If not, you can never defeat the Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. And so and so understanding some of these things, brothers, is very, very important. And and it, it's very easy to have an idol in your life if you don't understand some of this. And when you read the book of Revelation carefully, the Bible says that when John saw the angel who was telling him the vision, right? He, I mean, he wanted to worship the angel. But the angel said, no, worship God. That's what the angel said. No, worship God. So it's very easy for you to focus on something and allow that thing to influence your life. And, and for you, know, that has become your idol. When, when John received the vision, of course, he was overwhelmed. You know, those great things. So when he finally met the angel, he was showing him and explaining things, and he was like, wow, this is God. He wanted to bow. And then he said, don't do that. Worship the Lord Almighty. The temptation to allow people, situations, life start to influence you, brothers and sisters, is very, very strong these days. And they can easily become an idol. Uh, uh, in your life. So so when we look at the seven mountains of mantle of prophecy of life, we mentioned you you can easily identify idols or places or situations where Satan will want to take charge. Right? And and once I pray the Lord will give you great understanding more. Once you see that you begin to pray and you don't allow that situation to have dominion over you. Quickly. If not, that situation, that price, and that lifestyle now has become an idol and it influence your life. And you ask the question, why that? Why that? The angel told that uh, uh, to Gideon, get rid of that idol. If you really want to be uh, successful, get rid of that idol. 
And let's look at God's glory, is it? We are looking at God expect us to replace all idols with his glory. So let's look at God's glory here. So God's glory is, is his glory, it's his presence, it's, his, it's anything. It could be, I believe, his Holy Spirit. It could be a lifestyle that he has, I mean, prescribed to us. He, it can be his servant, but God's glory or, or, or whatever God uses to display his glory will always draw us closer to himself. That's what it means. Whereas an idol will move us away from God. So when the earth is filled with God's glory, then everything in this world will help us to worship God. That's what it means. Everything. The angels will help us. The ministers, the church, even the trees. When you look at the trees, you want to give glory to God. When the earth is filled with God's glory, that draws us to his presence. As his chosen people. Whereas an idol will move us away from God. And we don't believe in God. We don't trust in God anymore. Then that idol will not take the place of God in our life. It could be a lifestyle as well. Which draws us closer to God. God's glory brings his presence. His blessings upon the people. The glory of God upon us make us shine. And bestow upon us all we need to do great things to honor God. So Moses Exodus 33 was saying the Lord, Lord, let your glory. I, I want to see your glory because I can't do that. I can't lead the people without your glory. I want to see your glory. And the glory of the Lord is there. And this Christmas, these are the things we must be thinking about. Hallelujah. That the glory of the Lord should come upon us. It helps us to shine. The absence of God's glory makes us very weak. Vulnerable and hopeless. And of course, it is obvious that we need God's glory. Hallelujah. I first Samuel 4, 12, 22 tells us that when the glory left the people, the people were defeated, the Israelites. When the ark was taken, it was defeated. And David cried in Psalm, 1, Psalm 51, verse 11 and 12. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Because without your presence, without your glory, no life. Without your presence, without your glory, no life. And, and I think uh, we need more of God's glory. Hallelujah. We need things that will, will draw us closer to God. We need lifestyles and ideologies that will help us to see his glory. We need men and women who encourage us to look to the Lord. We need policies that will encourage us to be godly and be righteous. And these are all ways that of replacing idols in our lives and in society with God's glory. In the absence of that, then we become very weak and very, very vulnerable. So Christmas can be a very great opportunity. Hallelujah. So it should be glory. We look to Christ. And I think, I think traditionally we say that Christ was born on 25th, right? Okay, so on that 25th, I'm sure it was a, a birthday for some idol. And then we are forcing Christ's birth on that day. We have, we have said that Jesus take that 25th. To be a day of birth. Just as the, the angel told uh, Gideon that build a proper altar here where the, the altar of Baal was. Now put God's one there. So any idol, you can replace that idol with God's glory. Now at some point, not this year, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit more history about this building, right? Is it? I'm going to give you a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, some information, but not now. I remember I mentioned few to Sharon, and she said, ah, "But you didn't tell us all this. Why should I tell you?" <laughs> not now, maybe next year, summer when uh, we, we are well settled. 
then I tell you, you anything that is not of God, you have a duty to replace that thing with God. And so Paul will tell us in First Timothy four forty five that you see when you are giving food, just pray over it and eat. That become holy. Hallelujah. We have sadly the I mean the way the world is going, our leaders will not tell us to worship God. And we have the duty to do that. So let's see what happens if you don't replace idols, right? What happens? So if Gideon had not done what the angel told him, it means that that idol bar would have still harmed them. That's the first thing. So when you don't replace that idol, when you look at it and you love it and you smile, <laughs> that idol will still harm you. Yeah, it's there. It will harm you. So you have to deal with it. And to deal with some of these things, we won't touch on these things tonight. And maybe after Christmas. It's not easy. When Gideon tried to, when, when he did it, when he destroyed the altar of Baal, the whole town came. They wanted to kill him. So when you destroy altars and idols, no one will clap for you. No. They will come after you. But the thing is that you are already victorious. So you don't even need to be worried. Just commit yourself to God and God will deal with the issue. Hallelujah. I mean, at this day, we don't see physical either, so you find it difficult to understand. Uh, years ago, I went, to, I went to Ghana, and I was preaching to a group of people, and they were told, uh, telling me how they went to a place where they were all worshipping idols, and then they had to physically take those idols, those shrines, and, and then burn them. Burn them. And then when they finished, the king called them. That's lovely. He said, I think you've done a good job for us. Because these idols, we didn't even know what to do with them. And they've been disturbing us quite a lot. And so I think they had, they had to go there to, to help the people to understand the Christian faith and to be set free. Because wherever there's idols, you have poverty. And filth. Because that, that's what the idols, they feed on. Hallelujah. So let's see what happens if you don't if you don't really replace them. The idol will continue to harm you. And the story of Gideon tells us that the people were suffering. When you go read the whole chapter six, if you don't deal with it, it will still be there and will harm you. The second reason is the second thing that could happen is that God will restore restore his own glory. But that you miss out on the experience. So if, if there's an idol and you don't replace it with God's glory, God himself can do it without you. But then he's doing it for some people, not you. Because you have refused to do it. Let's look at this example. First Samuel 5, 1 to 7. It talks about how how the people place the ark of God in the same room with a, with an idol, hallelujah. Yeah. And then you see what happens. First Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. That God can restore his own glory, but then we will not be part of it. We won't, we won't experience it. First Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. I read, now after the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. So Dagon was their idol, their God. So they carried the ark of God and then they put that ark in the same room where Dagon, their idol, was. See what happened. Now here the Israelites had been defeated. There was no any man, any woman who was standing in the gap for the Lord. So the people captured the ark of God. They thought God could not defend himself. Verse 3. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. See what happened? So the ark of God, and then they have their idol called Dagon. 
Then they captured God's ark and put that ark in that dark on that room. And when they woke up the following morning, their God had bowed down. And bowed before the ark of God. So, so those gods, Paul will say that they are nothing. They are nothing. They only have power because some people will worship and pay attention to those idols. So God, there was no uh, believer there. The Philistines captured God's ark and then put it in that same room where their idol was. When they woke up in the morning, their God had bowed down to the Almighty God. Hallelujah. Every knee will bow to Jesus. Every knee bow to Jesus. Every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. When you have Christ Jesus in your life, take your time to understand the faith that you have come to. And you will never be afraid of all this. Thing. Because you have come. As we looked at last on Tuesday, you have come to the Almighty God who has the greatest power on it. So the ark was falling down before. So they took that God and put him back in his place. So if you have to carry your God, then he's not a God. <laughs> If you have to carry God, so you, you God, you've, 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 I, you've went to war and then you've been beaten, so you want me to come and carry you. Meanwhile, to draw my protection from you because you cannot protect me. So the, so the first one, they went and then they, they positioned their idol there. And let's see what happened. Verse 4. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon falling on his face. On the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. Hallelujah. He's cut it. That's the power of God. That is why to this day, neither the priest of Dagon nor any others who entered Dagon's temple at Ashtar stepped on the threshold. And so here we are saying that God can restore his own glory. Hallelujah. And so, and so if, 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 if you read the rest of the chapter, the people now had to consult and take the ark of the Lord back to Israel. And if you want to go to the land of Israel, no one was willing to take it. And then he went to a place for a long time. And then that person was blessed, and later David them tried, wanted to carry it back. So God can restore his own glory in the world. Hallelujah. And this makes me very, very happy. Because if we cannot, God will do, will do it himself. What we cannot do, God can do. But that if we refuse to replace idols, all that means that we will not be part of the experience, the blessings. Now God himself will do the thing. So let's look at some of the idols we now have and how we can replace them. I'll just mention a few. And I'm sure what we'll be doing for the next 20 minutes will be enough. Hallelujah. To empower you to, to be replacing idols daily in your lives. You don't allow them to influence your life. Practically. If not, then like what the Israelites experience. You just suffer unnecessary. Okay, I mean, I, I, I would say, I don't can be someone who has a very commanding spirit that he or she wants everyone who comes close to him or her to should, should, should submit. And so that person begins to influence. And then, and then, and then, and then you struggle. But the glory of God sets us free to live the life that God has ordained us. Hallelujah. So and so, this practical thing you really, really understand how things. I mean, I don't know. I've been in the church uh, in the past. A lot of people try to do that, so that so that they can influence the church. And then I had to fight them because I knew the 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 consequences. Because then it will no more be the spirit of Christ who will be in charge of the church, but they will be in charge of the church. So when you read the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Christ addressed them, right? So it's very important. Some of you, as you are maturing, you begin to understand some of these things. 
Hallelujah. Even at your workplace, in your family, there are some people you don't have to. Because if you do, you come under their influence and you will live their life. Meanwhile, God has a special life ordained for you. Very important. Okay. So where are the idols and how do we replace it? Okay. Let's say that every idol should be treated differently. Every idol should be treated differently. So, so physical idols, yeah, you can take them, throw them in a bin, pray over them, and that's it. That's a physical one. But if it's not your idol, and it doesn't concern you, you don't go around and do that. If, 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 if that thing is disturbing you, that's the only time. You can engage. But if not, that it has not, it's none of. So let's say today, if you go to Easter, if some people open their windows, you see quite a lot of them. Don't just do knock, knock, and enter and just start pulling people's idols and praying and breaking. No. They want the idol. <laughs> They've gone for it. But that if the idol is harming you, then you have the right to engage. Hallelujah. If not, you just just leave because the, the world is not for you. The world is for God. And then he will handle them. So every other so you can you can replace idols, for example, this Christmas with the Christian message about Christ. So this Christmas you make it about Jesus and you make sure the family celebrates it in a godly way. Then you'll be, be very kind to people. Make sure you don't spend too much. Because to me, I think it's not necessary to spend a lot of money Christmas time now. If you have enough, you spend. If you don't have, just make sure you don't disturb the family. Hallelujah. So, so you, can, uh, you can spend the Christmas in a godly way. Let it be about Jesus. Watch movies about Jesus, his birth, right? It's how Christ was born. There, there are quite a lot of movies you can watch with the kids as a family. You just sit at home. I know cinemas are not open, so you can't go out to watch. So if there's church service, yeah, the whole family, you go, you listen to the play, the sermon, the, the, I mean, the verses that will be read. And then, yeah, you just have good meal, then you just rest. You don't need to spend a lot of money this Christmas. You know, it, I don't think it's necessary. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so, and so let the message be about Jesus. And as long as you don't indulge yourself in excess, drinking and eating, I think, I think that will be godly. Hallelujah. Okay, so this is an example, Christmas. And then uh, we can also say prayers in the name of the Lord and, and dedicate things. So, uh, so there are some things. So uh, when we came to this building, we just pray dedicated it. That's it. We have replaced every idol here with the glory of God. So prayer can also do that. So you buy a house, you pray, you dedicate your house to God. The previous owners, if, if they were idol worshippers, those demands will run away. Because a man, a woman has come into the house who worships the, the almighty God. And so the demon has no place in the house. They must go. Prayer will do the job. So there are some things you pray to God. It becomes holy, sacred. And because you call upon the Lord, he will come. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 4 to 5 will tell us that. So in the old days, idols were physical, physical things visible in the community. And it was believed to be responsible for rain, fertility, luck, those days. So people have a lot of idols. So they have one that is responsible for, uh, let's say, rain. They have one that is responsible for fertility. One responsible for good harvest. One responsible for security. So they have different. So if you want, if you want security, you go to that idol that can provide security. And so when Israel, when God called Israel, he told them, I am the Lord your God, and there's only one God. I'm not divided. I'm only one. And I can provide all things for you. So Paul, in uh, 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 Ephesians, Philippians uh, 2, he took the same thing and said, there is only one God. There is only one Lord. There is only one faith. 
There is only one baptism. There is only one church. But in the pagan world, they have different gods. So a god of fertility, a god of that. So God told them, I am the Lord your God. One. There is none beside me. So don't say that I'm the God who brought you out of Israel, but there's another God who can give us food. I'm one. There is no God beside me. But in the pagan world, they have different, different, different gods for different uh, needs. So in our modern times, and that's why I said this book is very, very good. It informs quite a lot. Uh, in, in, in our modern times, the, the idols occupied uh, almost every aspect of our lives. So we don't see the physical thing. So they've called it the seven mountains of prophecy or what I call life. So they are education, government, media, family, religion, economy, arts, and culture. That's arts and culture. Those are red carpet people, is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so any of these can influence your life. So let's talk about education. Now, if in that sector, their policies are not godly, right? And then that will influence our life. But that becomes an idol. So if we have our system and it's anti-God, that's an idol. So how do you engage with that? So it's not everything that they throw at you that you, you just take on board. But you use the word of God to differentiate that which will help you to draw closer to God. Amen. So that's education. So let's talk about, let's say, uh, a religion, right? Religion, every religion should lead you to God through Jesus. If not, then you have to be careful. So now we have more than 100 religions in the world. So every religion, uh, we Christians, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So we focus on Christ. So if any other religion can tell us that Jesus is the way to the Father, yes. If not, okay, this is not ours. But if you want it, that is good. We don't want it. Because religion can become an idol. Let's talk about, uh, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the economy, right? Okay, the economy is simple. If the economy is anti-God, the only way to be successful is to become very greedy. Right? Uh, to become greedy. Yeah, so all you want is profit, 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 profit. You don't care about the people who work under you. So, so people who, who have who, are, who really love the system of the world and they want to become rich and they are anti-God, they are very greedy. If you are not greedy, you cannot really enjoy the economy. So it's greed, and greediness is a trait of Satan. If you are not greedy, and you, are, no, you, you cannot. So, so those who are greedy, and so how can we uh, uh, replace this with God's glory? That we practice Kingdom principle. We don't become greedy. We help people. We pay our workers the right wages. That is how you can defeat. The moment you also become greedy to get greedy, greedy, that has become your idol. And, 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 then, and then that will influence your life. I, I get it something. So, so practically, that is how we have to engage with all these uh, things that are becoming our gods. I've, got, I've talked to quite a lot of people, and one man told me years ago, he said, Pastor, any time I wake up 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. before I go to bed, all I think about is money. And I look at him, and I was very sad. <laughs> he said, I swear, I, I can't lie to you, Pastor. I'm always thinking about money, money, money. I, I remember, I remember, I remember those days had some car, blue car, Chrysler. I don't know if some of you saw some blue car. And then, and then it, I think it was too old. For, so I said, I want to, 
I want to get rid of it and get a new one. You know what he said? He said, he said give it to me. <laughs> and I said, for what? He said, I'm going to sell it and get money. <laughs> you are laughing. <laughs> And I was like, no, I gave it to him anyway. So, so he sold it and a little profit of uh, maybe 500, 500 pounds. He took the car and then watched it do something. And then just that is the system. So, so now money is his God. Now, if you don't understand some of this, you may think you are Christian, yet you are not. You are something that is more important to you than God. It's because of the lifestyle and the principle that you have believed and practiced. Are we here? Yeah, so what I'll do is that after Christmas, I will, I will maybe somewhere in February, we will, we will take time to look at the seven, uh, seven mountain of life or, or mantle of prophecy. So, so let's talk about, for example, uh, what, what, what family life, right? Family life now is being contested, you know, that we have to redefine what marriage is, gender, everything. Now, if you follow any of those principles that are not God, then that will become an idol. You become obsessed with it. And so, so, so if you want to replace that with God's glory, you take time and you study what God says or God's vision for family life. And the moment you practice that, you, you replace that idol with God's glory. Are you here with me? If not, you may think you are Christian, but you are following an ideology that is anti-God. And so that is your God. And then uh, we can talk about uh, what? Uh, we can talk about... Uh, uh, art and culture, right? Art and culture. So you make sure the culture, the art, you make sure they help you to draw close out to God. So let's talk about it. Let, let's even mention uh, some of the uh, uh, things we see around and, and then some of the things that these uh, uh, men and women, they do. Um, uh, most of them are anti-God. So, so it, it is good we, we, we celebrate, but um, we, we must make sure that they are not anti-God. If not, we have adopted forms and culture that will become idols in our lives. And, there, and therefore, we will not be able to exhibit God's glory. Hallelujah. And then we, we, we struggle. We can even mention the media. You make sure you watch movies that will draw you closer to God. In fact, it left me alone that kids should have special movies to watch. But these days, the movies that they watch and all that, in a very nice way, they are trying to condition their, their mind to, to accept and to see some things as, as good and normal. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, some of the characters, characters too, 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 too much. But no, 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 they'll just be watching and be laughing. Now, take them and, and just look at what your child is watching. Sometimes they'll be watching something, all of a sudden, a big snake will pop up and they'll be okay with it. When we're growing up, you run away. Because we know snake is evil. And then, and then, and then they'll be watching and then someone, you know, a character will say, Oh, I am a witch. I have magical powers. And those things. And then they will keep watching. So, so if in media, somehow, it's, 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 it's sort of a God that is taking people's heart and love from the Almighty God. Are we here tonight? Okay, so what these men are arguing is that it is good Christians pray to God and occupy these positions so that they can bring the glory of God there. And so uh, that is where I only have some problem, right? I have problem there because the calling is that we should come out from those uh, places because the, the evil there is too much, hallelujah. But if God has called you there, then go. 
and do it because then God will be with you. But you should not think of pursuing that as a lifestyle. That I really want to get into, let's say, uh, education to restore the glory of God there. No. But if God calls you there, then he's going to empower you to work hard. Hallelujah. Okay, so, so now, due to uh, the fact that we want our society to be secular, all these areas have become anti-God. Right? All these areas... So now they don't pray at schools anymore, is it? They don't read Bibles anymore. But before, decades, years ago, you pray, they'll tell you about God as the creator. They tell you about Jesus Christ as the savior. And then by these days, no more. So then you have to be a bit more careful so that you don't allow some of these things to become your God at all. So we can engage with all the, the seven mountains of life in a way that draws us closer to God. So we make sure our educational system draws us closer to God. And when it comes to uh, governance, we pray that our leaders are God. Hallelujah. I always make sure that your leader is godly. If not, pray that godly staff will come from him or her. And then also, our families should be godly as well. And when it comes to celebration, we don't allow world entertainment to, to interest us. Hallelujah. Our, our religion should lead us to God through Jesus Christ. With regards to our economy, we follow God's principle. The moment you begin to do that, you are replacing idols with the glory of God. And then you see the difference. Yeah, see the difference in your life. So I will take time for us to look at all the seven months a little bit more in detail at the writer but tonight we are just looking at how we can make this christmas uh, a better christmas for god in other words in the words of the angel how we can replace or build a proper altar to the lord how we can celebrate a proper uh, christmas to god so that we, we will enjoy god's glory and, and god's blessing so may the lord bless us Tonight, and then as you go home, begin to learn how to replace every idol with the glory of God. Practically, if you don't do it, that thing is watching and that will harm you. If you don't do it, the Israelites were there for decades, the Midianites were harming them until the Lord touched Gideon's heart and Gideon destroyed that bar, that idol, and the people started prospering. If you don't deal with it. So when we look at how to deal with it at a, at a lot of time, it's not easy. Yeah, if you, if, if you try to, I mean, I don't forget the promise. Uh, Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman will, will defeat the enemy, right? But the enemy will do what? It's going to strike the, yeah, the heel, right? So when you crush the idol, don't think that you go free. And that's a lot of Christians get frustrated. When you crush it, the enemy will also come after you, but he comes as a defeated foe. He can't have victory again. Now, he will come after you, but he's already defeated. And so if, if you are not strong in the Lord, you, you run away when the enemy tries. I, I think you know the story of uh, Elijah and Jezebel, right? Elijah destroyed all, almost 400 uh, uh, prophets of Baal and all Baal worship. And, and then Jezebel said, I'm coming for you. And then he, will, he ran away. The enemy will always try to chase you once you defeat him. Hallelujah. But he is a defeated foe. So may the Lord bless us tonight. And those who are listening online, make sure that you replace all idols in your life with God's glory. If not, those things are watching and they will harm you and they will make you vulnerable and that they will attract enemies into your life. Because uh, that is the design of the enemy. But God's glory will bring blessings and freedom and peace and holiness, righteousness, justice into your life. And God expect you and I to do that. May the Lord bless us. Let's pray. And then we can bring the service to a close. Father, we